This past week we had delicious meals every night prior to the revival services. They were wonderful. And as a result, today is the fifth Sunday, but in light of the fact that we did meals all week long for the revival, we opted not to have a meal after church today. That being said, my family out at Red Springs is having a meal after church today. It's the fifth Sunday. And therefore, I'm going to give y'all a little treat this morning. Don't get used to it. I'm going to try to finish intentionally a little bit early today. Y'all pray for me that I can actually do that. You know I love to talk. So that I can scoot out of here and pardon me for being abrupt when I leave today. I'll try to stick around for a moment and get back out there to eat with my church family at Red Springs. And so, with that being said, I'm going to hop right in to the message today. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 if you can, when you find it, please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word together. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. The Apostle writes, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Jesus Christ died for sins once for all. Father God, as we study your word today, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to whatever it is that you have to say to us. I pray that you would just use me as a mouthpiece and just speak your words to us today so that we all might hear whatever it is that you want to communicate to us and that we might Respond accordingly to the power and the transform, transforming effect of your word on our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back now to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And we will continue where we left off two weeks ago before our revival services. The message two weeks ago was called A Better Sacrifice, Part 1. And so we had a break in between, but today we are going to conclude that message or that pair of messages with a message called A Better Sacrifice, Part 2. Now in the first sermon of the pair, if you may remember, or you could just look back to the latter part of chapter 9, the author of Hebrews was talking about the potency of the blood of Christ. The potency, the power that the blood of Christ has to do something that the blood of sheep and goats can never do. We talked about the blood of Jesus being symbolic of the life of Jesus. Jesus gave His life on Calvary as evidenced by the remission of His blood so that sins could be eternally forgiven. We also learned that covenants are established by and validated by the shedding of blood or the giving of a life. We also read that the blood of bull and goats that was spilled on the altar during countless Old Testament sacrifices was never able to cleanse the conscience. It was powerless to affect forgiveness. It was impotent to resolve the issue of sin. And yet, the blood of Jesus has the power and has the ability to wash sin away 
to forgive it, to completely to atone for the sins of mankind. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonder-working power in the blood. In today's message, as we continue this idea of this great sacrifice that Jesus gave by offering Himself, we are going to discuss not the potency of the blood of Christ, but the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice. This is part two of this idea of a better sacrifice. The word sufficiency means adequate or enough. As we have done previously, and it, it's kind of a the M.O. of the author of Hebrews, he will take and compare that which was old, in this case the offerings of animals under the old covenant, with that which is new, in this case, the grueling crucifixion of Jesus Christ, whereby the new covenant was established. And by making this comparison, as he's done numerous times throughout this book, he will once again show that Jesus is better, and that the Lord's sacrifice is far superior to the sacrifices made under the old covenant. Listen. Listen. For most of my married life, my wife and I have hand-washed all of our dishes. Now, she gets on me from time to time, and rightfully so, because she wants a dishwasher. But for almost all of our lives, even now in the parsonage, we have hand-washed dishes. And I say we, me, about 2% of the time, and her about 98% of the time. And full disclosure. But on the rare occasion that I do wash dishes, I, I sometimes kind of find it therapeutic. Owen will go wash dishes from time to time. He'll turn his music on. He's in there washing and jamming. We'll give you 0.5%. We don't have a dishwasher in our home, so almost every night we have a routine after supper there will be a sink full of plates and bowls and cups and other things. We love Paul so very much, but he adds to our dishes. We love you, Paul. Leah, Coy, Owen's home this weekend. You know how it is. It doesn't take just that long. You wash the dishes, you finish, you put the last one, you turn around, there's ten more dirty ones already. Listen. Wouldn't it be incredible if there was some way to wash something so completely, so thoroughly that you could do it one time and you would never have to wash it again? Wouldn't that be awesome if you could clean the dirt and the filth and the grime and the defilement away and it would never, ever, ever return. Could such a wondrous thought, could such a complete and whole cleansing ever even be possible? And if so, what exactly would it pertain to? Spoiler alert, not dishes. Something a lot better though. You see, these are the questions that we are going to address in this morning's message, just briefly this morning. Let's start with a constant reminder. A constant reminder. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, the author of Hebrews states, For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have, have had consciousness of sins. 
But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The writer of Hebrews begins this portion of his letter by again reminding the audience that sacrificial offerings which are made under the law, which, by the way, forms the basis of the Old Covenant, can never, can never wash away sins. They are unable, wholly unable, to make perfect those who draw near. Did you see that? We talked about this at length last week, but he gives us a quick reminder to reaffirm that point. The, the impotency of the blood of goats and lambs and bulls. It is powerless to forgive sin. But now he's going to move into his second part of that. What else about Jesus' sacrifice is superior? The sufficiency. The sufficiency. Because of their inadequacy, these Old Testament sacrifices, notice this, had to be repeated continually year by year. There was an ongoing practice of animal sacrifice, and although it was powerless to forgive sin, it continued again and again and again. And he asked a question, which is a fair question, I think, He said, if these sacrifices had the power to make perfect those who draw near, why would they continue to repeat them over and over again? If they worked and did what they were intended or or purported to do, then why was it necessary to continue to repeat these things time and time over? Instead, they would have forgotten about, they would have, they would have no conscience, consciousness of their sins because they would have been completely washed away. And therefore, the animal sacrifices would have ceased to, to be a practice. And yet we all know that's not the case. That's not what happened throughout the years of the Old Testament. And even into the early parts of the New, while Jesus walked the earth. And even for a while after Jesus walked the earth and the Jews continued this misguided practice until the destruction of the temple some 40 years later. Listen, the numerous and ongoing sacrifices that took place in the Old Testament, not only were they ineffective, but did you notice here, verse 3, they were a constant reminder of sins. You know, I don't know about you, but I would think that it would be somewhat burdensome to have to go find an animal, a perfect animal, your best animal, or to go purchase an animal with money that you had uh, painstakingly earned, and then, depending on where you lived in Israel, to make the sojourn all the way to Jerusalem, to take off you know, a week from work so that you could walk to Jerusalem with your family and and your servants or whoever came with you in your entourage so that you could go to the temple and you could make your annual sacrifices. And by law, they had to do that three times a year. Don't you think that 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 would be kind of a, 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 a burdensome thing to do? And the people who lived in Jerusalem, maybe they didn't have to travel, but you know what they got to hear and see and smell every single day? Animals being sacrificed in the temple. A constant reminder. Why is this being done? This is being done because we're sinners. This is being done because we carry a heavy yoke upon us. We are wicked people. Constant reminders. You couldn't forget it. You couldn't just for even a moment say, you know what, 
I'm forgiven. <laughs> Sin is, is, does not have dominion in my life. I am set free. No, under the Old Covenant, constant reminder of the weight of sin pressing on you. I go to the temple, I make my offering, I turn around and as I'm walking out, I'm thinking to myself, I have to come back later. Because sin is already, you're, it's already on me. As soon as I finish my offering, turn around. Here comes the next guy up, and you know what? In four months, that's going to be me right back here. Because I can't get away from my sin. And nothing can take it away. This was the old covenant. Beloved, the dishes just kept getting dirty. And they wouldn't stay clean. They just wouldn't stay clean. Let's look at the second point. The Lord's displeasure. The Lord's displeasure, starting in verse 5. Therefore, when He comes into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices, you have not taken pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of Me to do Your will, O God. After... Saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure of the, in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. You see, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The Lord's displeasure. The Lord's displeasure. Here the writer of Hebrews cites the words of David which are found in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. That's the citation we read there, Psalm 40, 6 through 8. If you go back to Psalm 40, David is writing this psalm to thank the Lord, to praise the Lord for hearing his cry, for sustaining him and delivering him through a difficult time of tribulation. And most Scholars and historians think that David wrote Psalm 40 in the aftermath of the rebellion of Absalom. And that David expressed his gratitude and his appreciation to the Lord for sustaining him through the rebellion of a son who tried to usurp the throne and temporarily did. And ran David out of Jerusalem. You remember that. We studied that a few years ago in our United Kingdom series. And so David is thanking the Lord in this psalm. And the writer of Hebrews takes it now and he uses these very words as an application to Christ Himself. You notice here it says, God the Father does not take pleasure in, verse 6, He does not take pleasure in or desire the burnt offerings or any other sacrifices for sins that were made under the law. Now I'm sure he was pleased by the people's obedience. After all, God had given the law directly to Moses and he gave it to them with the, intent, with the expectation that they would follow it. But at the same time, he did not take full gratification. They were not sufficiently pleasing to the Lord. They were unacceptable and they were inadequate. The only sacrifice that would be acceptable would not be the body of a bull or a sheep, but the body of Christ. But a body you have prepared for me. You see, Jesus came to offer Himself. That was the reason for which He came to this earth and condescended to man. And by the way, it was condescension because He stepped down. He left His throne to come down here for us. He humbled Himself. And He gave His life on Calvary 
to do something that the blood of sheep and goats could never do. And he did so, did you catch it? According to the pleasures of God's will. This was God's plan. This was God's intention. From the very beginning, Scripture says Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. In God's mind, this was always His plan. And Jesus came not to try to uh, dodge God's will or to avoid God's will, but to do God's will and to give His life for us. Look at verse 9. Behold, I have come to do your will, and in so doing, God takes away the first, that is, the old covenant, the, the insufficient sacrifices, in order to establish the second, the new covenant, established by, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which by faith through grace, uh, grace through faith, I should say, makes it possible for any a repentant sinner to come and receive salvation. By His death on Calvary, Jesus sanctified, that, that is to say, Jesus cleansed and set apart for Himself a people that consists of all of those who believe on His name. He rectified the Lord's displeasure. <laughs> And then finally, one sufficient offering. Starting in verse 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet, for by one offering He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law upon their heart and in their mind I will write them. He then says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. For now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. You know, I, I, I suppose that these still exist, but I think about in our history books uh, the Industrial Revolution around the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, the 20, whatever it is, I get my centuries backwards, 1900s into 2000s, no, 1800s into 1900s. There you go, I got it. The Industrial Revolution. During that time, there were factory workers that would line up on an assembly line, which was a, a great innovation. The assembly line forever changed the way we do industrial type work. And that worker had one job. And as the things would come down the assembly line, he would mindlessly or she would mindlessly repeat the same mundane task over and over and over and over again. And it would pass to the next person who would do their task and the next person and so forth. And by the end of the line, it was ready to go. It was done. But as I think about the redundancy of the assembly line, I can't help but think about the priests who there in the temple or tabernacle would stand and offer the same sacrifices day after day after day, although they could never forgive sin. Think about that. Do you think that the priest, having stood there all day long doing sacrifices, sacrifices, next, 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 do you think it was possible or maybe ever happened in the course of hundreds of years of Old Testament history that the priest just kind of got into a routine and his heart really wasn't into it? I think there's a pretty good likelihood. Next. I wish that goat would shut up. Okay, good. 
Next. I mean, you would hope that wouldn't happen, but beloved, human nature tells us maybe it did. I mean, I can tell you that even as a pastor, sometimes, you know, I get in the routine and just kind of like, and, and I need to wake myself up. I need God to get a hold of me. I need to be revived. That's why we have revivals. To remind me of what I'm doing and the importance of it. Listen, same thing over and over. Did you notice the contrast the writer of Hebrews made? I love it. The priests stand day after day. But you know what Jesus did? He offered his sacrifice once and then he wouldn't sit down. That contrast is is significant. Jesus made a single, all-sufficient sacrifice and after so doing, he ascended into heaven where this passage tells us he now waits at God's right hand until his enemies are vanquished under his feet. They become his footstool. Jesus died one time, and for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who suffered. What a great sentence. And we don't even have to just rely on this text because the the text tells us the Holy Spirit within us testifies of this truth. The, the verses that are used here that he cites come from Jeremiah chapter 31, 33, and 34, which, by the way, were cited back in chapter 8. You could go back to chapter 8, and he cites this passage back there too. So I'm not going to go over the whole passage again. You could go back to your notes from a month ago and read what I said on that. But he repeats it because it is fitting and appropriate here. The forgiveness affected by Christ on the cross is all-encompassing. And beloved, there is no need for repeated sacrifices under the new covenant. Last verse of of the, the scripture today that we read, verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of sin, of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. It's done. The offering has been made and it is sufficient. It is sufficient. Beloved, all of us take showers virtually every day. During our showers, typically, most of us will wash our hair, right? Have you ever noticed the instructions on a bottle of shampoo? Three words, lather, rinse, repeat. Straightforward, simple, I like simple directions. I can follow simple directions. Lather, rinse, repeat. You see what the recommendation is, is that by repeating your hair washing, you're more likely to get it cleaner. Beloved, don't you thank God that such repetition is not necessary when it comes to cleansing away sin? The old covenant has been fulfilled. The old covenant is obsolete. The old covenant has, was never able to forgive sins. It always was pointing to the ability of Christ on the cross. It was always pointing to Jesus. There's no need, beloved, for us to repeat offerings again and again because Jesus died once for all. Hallelujah. Our sins are washed clean by the blood of Christ. Let me wrap up. Beloved, the sin issue is already dealt with. It's already done. Jesus has forever conquered sin and death. When Jesus shouted from the cross, it is finished, that's what he meant. Sin and death has been defeated. There is no need for any additional sacrifice. The wrath of God is fully appeased. The gift of forgiveness through Christ Jesus is now made available to anyone who would receive it. Salvation is freely offered to all who will come by faith and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And those who do so are rightly justified to God. They are rightly reconciled to God. They are adopted into His family. And nothing, nothing, no one can take their salvation from them. 
over the course of the past three chapters in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, 8, well, four chapters, really, 7, 8, 9, and 10, the author of Hebrews has presented Jesus primarily as two different things. He's our perfect high priest who entered into the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf in order to offer himself as our all-sufficient sacrifice. He is both the giver and the gift. Jesus is the priest that could enter into a place where we can't go because we are defiled by sin to offer himself as a sacrifice in lieu of insufficient and impotent sacrifices that could never ever forgive men of their sin. In so doing, Jesus has established a newer and greater covenant which is built upon God's amazing grace through faith in Christ. What a glorious thought, beloved. We are free from the rigorous demands and requirements of the law. We are forever free from the bondage of sin. Very simple on the bottom. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross was and is sufficient for all time. It does not need to be repeated. But beloved, we have been set free, but as you have heard, with freedom comes responsibility. And that's where the author is going to go next. We've been set free, but we've not been set free to be lazy. We've not been set free to be do-nothing. We've not been set free to live lives selfishly or self-righteously. We have been set free to live out the calling and the will of God in our life. And we have, with our freedom, responsibilities that are inherent to that freedom. And so starting next week, we will begin looking at a few of these responsibilities as we move into the latter third of the book of Hebrews. But until then, let us reflect this week on the sacrifice of Jesus, the sufficiency of it, the fact that He died once for all, and that no such sacrifice or any other sacrifice for sins is ever necessary. We just have to rely on Him. And let the awe and the wonder of who Christ is and what He has done ruminate in your heart and in your mind. He is a better sacrifice. Father God, thank You for today. Thank You for this message. I just pray you would impress it upon our hearts, God, and that we would realize and reflect and truly, God, be filled with joy, overflowing for the sacrifice that you made so that we might be redeemed, saved, and adopted and called the children of God. What a tremendous, tremendous blessing and privilege it is. God, thank you for your love and mercy for us. I pray that if there's any lost person here today, they need to be saved. Let them come and do that this morning, right here at the altar. Give their heart and life to you. Place their faith and trust in you. I pray that if there are Christians here today that need to recommit their lives to you, that need to make decisions under church membership, baptism, whatever it may be, I don't know, God, you know. I pray that they would do so either there at their pews or right here at the altar during this invitation. We love you, Jesus. We thank you so much for your better sacrifice that you gave your life for us. We praise you. Thank you. Amen. We're going to sing number 170.